on Jerusalem Dateline. This week on Jerusalem Dateline, a wave of terror hits Jerusalem and spreads throughout Israel. From a bus attack to a bus stop, to random attacks and from kids as young as 13, we'll bring you reports on what's behind the violence. Plus, World Jewish Congress President Ron Lauder talks with CBN founder Pat Robertson about the situation. And Christmas in October, a Christian choir brings some joy to the city in the midst of all the terror. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. It's been a deadly time here in Jerusalem and throughout Israel as a wave of Palestinian terror attacks have spread throughout the land. Palestinian Arabs committed at least three more terror attacks, two in Jerusalem and another in central Israel. What took place here in Amon Anativ in a relatively quiet neighborhood, two terrorists carried out an attack on a bus. One of them was armed with a pistol, the second one with a knife. They uh, injured five Israelis. What we confirmed uh, is that our police units that arrived at the scene shot and killed one of the terrorists. The second terrorist was apprehended. Aaron Adler arrived on the scene as one of the first responders. When I arrived on scene, there was actually still shooting on the scene. Uh, we found the bus here behind us with multiple gunshot wound victims inside the bus. Together with the other crews, we, uh, we pulled them out and started uh, life-saving treatments. Whatever we could do to try saving their lives. Jerusalem's mayor, Nair Barkad, blames Palestinian incitement. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas began the incitement last month when he said the Al-Aqsa Mosque was in danger and that the Israeli government was changing the status quo on the Temple Mount. Which is not true, which is a, a lie, it's just a filthy lie. However, the residents, some of the residents believe those lies. And uh, those incitements are sending people to kill innocent people. We've just seen in the last few days children, uh, high school children, that are incited, that go and try and, uh, and terrorize and kill uh, policemen. They don't return home. They themselves get killed. The incitement kills on both sides. Some Israelis are concerned they're on the verge of a third Palestinian intifada, a word that means uprising. The first took place in the late 80s and early 90s, and the second took place from 2000 to 2004. The latest wave of violence has shaken Israelis. We are terrified, and uh, the world thinks that uh, we do a, we are not a justice with the Arabs. This is not true. They have uh, ID like I do, and they kill us. It's hard. It's. Uh... It's, uh, it's not a good situation, but, um, but we, we do what we can. Uh, we believe in what we do and we know, that, uh, we know the purpose behind it. We understand the calling. Jerusalem's mayor said this wave of violence is a wake-up call for the nations. Now the experience we're going through here in our city will haunt the rest of the world in a few years from now. You have to understand that terrorism, this kind of terrorism, is not just a Jerusalem problem. It's not just an Israeli problem. It's an international problem, and if you don't understand and support us in fighting terrorism here, it, next phase will happen everywhere else in the world. It's hard sometimes for Israelis to walk down the street or wait at a bus stop without fearing a Palestinian terror attack. Here's the latest on the situation. A Palestinian posing as a photojournalist, wearing a safety vest and carrying equipment, stabbed an Israeli soldier. He was shot and killed. The incident was caught live by a Hamas TV crew. Ahead of the day of rage, rioting Palestinians burned the tomb of the biblical patriarch Joseph in Nablus. In a surprise move, Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas condemned the arson attack. Foreign Ministry Director General Dory Gold said it was similar to the actions of extremist Muslim groups from Afghanistan to Libya. Days of rage usually include Palestinian rioting and confrontation with Israeli troops at flashpoints in Judea and Samaria or the West Bank. But this one comes during a spate of terror that Israel hasn't seen for a long time. Prime Minister Netanyahu told journalists that incitement is behind the current wave of terrorism and violence. First on the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the outrageous claims that we are changing the status quo there or intend to destroy it. And now we have a new big lie. That new big lie is that Israel is executing Palestinians. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas accused Israel of executing what he called an innocent Palestinian boy. That boy stabbed an Israeli boy his own age earlier this week. 
First of all, he's not dead. He's alive. This uh, Palestinian terrorist is now being treated in Adassa Hospital in Israel. As for Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount, Israel says, as always, only Muslims are allowed to pray there. Christians and Jews have limited access and no prayer allowed. Netanyahu said the trouble doesn't have anything to do with whether or not there are peace talks. They're attacking us not because they want peace or don't want peace, it's because they don't want us here. Tension in Israel is palpable. Many Israelis are staying away from public places. Others aren't giving in. I've never seen a town like this before in my, my entire life. I've heard about it when I was a kid, about second to father, but I never heard it, I never felt this way. You know, when I see something on Facebook, it hurts inside to see it. And, um, you know, I, uh, I feel bad and I hope that anyone who gets injured is healed, healed fast. Yeah, it is sometimes, uh, it's scary to walk around. But um, it's, not, it's not that scary because I know, I know I believe in God and I know he's going to help us. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry says he's heading to the region to mitigate the wave of Palestinian terror and Israeli countermeasures that are sweeping the area. Meanwhile, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is increasing his incitement against the Jewish state. Israel says decades of incitement against Jews in Israel are behind Palestinian rage that's fueling the current wave of terrorism. Security here in Jerusalem is extremely tight. The government deployed more Israeli border police along with Jerusalem police to block entrances to Jerusalem's Arab neighborhoods like this one called Jabu Mokaber, where a number of the attackers came from. We hear again and again the slogan, Itbach el Yahud, kill the Jews, knife the Jews, death to the Jews in the name of Allah, in the name of defending Islam, in the, in the name of defending the Al-Aqsa Mosque. In a televised speech on Wednesday, Abbas accused Israel of increasing what he called its aggressive offensive against Palestinians and holy sites. What sends young people out with uh, butcher knives to attack Israelis, this phenomenon, is that it emanates from incitement, and particularly religious incitement incitement uh, around the uh, false accusation that Israel seeks to change the status quo on the Temple Mount. Israel was hoping Abbas would use his speech to calm the situation, but instead he didn't condemn the current wave of terror, nor call for a halt to attacks. He charged Israel with what he called field executions and said two teens who carried out a stabbing attack of an Israeli teenager early this week were martyrs. Their parents said they went to buy candy, but this security camera footage clearly shows the boys brandishing knives. One of the teens was killed as he tried to attack a policeman, but the other is alive and receiving treatment in an Israeli hospital. Yet Abbas said he was dead. Foreign Minister Director General Dory Gold pointed out that Abbas has been stoking the fire. No less than Mahmoud Abbas made the famous comment on September 16th of this year, we welcome every drop of blood spilled in Jerusalem. They, Israelis, have no right to desecrate the Al-Aqsa Mosque with their filthy feet. What is this? Social media is also helping to spread incitement and lies to the younger generation like this Hamas video that shows how to stab a Jew. On Wednesday, a Palestinian tried to stab a police officer at the Damascus Gate of the Old City. A television crew caught his attempted escape on film as he was shot and killed by security forces. A short time later, another terrorist stabbed a woman in her 70s at Jerusalem's central bus station. She managed to board the bus. The terrorist was shot and killed. Israelis are bracing themselves for Friday when Palestinians have called for another day of rage. And for now, the terror shows no signs of abating. Chris Mitchell, CBN News near Jabu Mukaber, Jerusalem. Coming up, World Jewish Congress President Ron Lauder talks with CBN founder Pat Robertson about the situation. World Jewish Congress President Ron Lauder called on Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas to quench the violence. He talked with CBN founder Pat Robertson about the situation. Are we seeing the beginning of a third intifada over there in Israel? I hope not. Um, we should do everything we can to stop this. Um, this is, the question is, 
has the Intifada ever stopped? Mm. But I don't believe this is the beginning of it. Uh, this, this could be, but I don't believe it will happen. And the fact is we must do everything we can now, um, both Israel, Palestinians, and the world, for example, to stop this and to say we must do everything we can for a two-state solution. Well, Mahmoud Abbas has uh, called for the shedding of Israeli blood and they quote, the filthy feet of Jews can't be any longer on the Temple Mount. I mean, he's not exactly trying to make peace, is he? I've spoken with him and he told me he believes in a two-state solution. And then he says something like this, it's just the opposite. Mm -hmm. And we must do everything we can. He must stand up and say to his people, enough is enough, please. We need peace and we need a future. And for him to give a speech at the UN talking about the Oslo Accords and, um, and saying that they're no longer valid is again counterproductive. The fact is that um, the Palestinians must understand that the future, their future, depends on this two-state solution, and everything that's being done is against it. Well, I understand that the uh, Israelis, Bibi uh, Netanyahu and others, have offered to them uh, concessions, extraordinary concessions, but based on a, a, some kind of a bilateral treaty, now they have gone directly to the U.N. to say you must force a solution on Israel whether they like it or not. Now, is, is that going to go down well with the Israeli people? Look, the Israeli people uh, want a two-state solution. But as time goes on, they believe uh, more and more that it would not be possible. Now, what's happening also um, is that very often uh, what is being attacked of on the, on the behalf of the Jewish people, is also an attack on the Christian people mm -hmm. because they're really in talk, talking about the fact of who belongs there. Um, this is a Jewish, Christian, Muslim place as well as must be all three. We must all live together. That is the critical question. And the leader, um, the leaders have to be able to do it, particularly the Palestinians. They must be able to say, Enough's enough. And when children go out and kill because they want to be martyrs, mm -hmm. what does that say? And when, when Abbas gives a speech about uh, one, one child being killed, executed, and then it turns out the child is in a hospital, an Israeli hospital being treated, what does that say? We must do what we can. But also, I, I was watching MSNBC this morning, and it says, Jewish extremists cause problems. And you, you read in certain papers, two Palestinian youths killed. They don't say that these are terrorists who, who stabbed somebody 15 times. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, we must understand that this is a question of people being incited to, to create violence. You know, I'm, I met several times with Yasser Arafat, and. Uh, Arafat didn't want peace. Uh, he got money from the other Arabs by causing trouble. And the original intifada was his deal. I mean, he had everything that was, every concession Israel could possibly give him. And he still wanted to fight. And uh, I wonder if the leaders feel the same way as he did. Well, I must tell you, um, I've never met with Arafat, but I have met with Abu Mazen. And I will say to you that uh, he's told me he wants peace. He wants a two-state solution, and he would like to find a way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, sometimes um, there are outside forces that push him to go one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, the real aspect is, if he was able to stand up and say, I want peace, I want to be able to find a way with Israel, it would change dramatically the whole uh, scene. But when he gives a speech at the UN talking about um, getting rid of the Oslo agreements and changing things, it doesn't help. Mm -hmm. Pat, can I say one more thing? Yes. I've been fighting strongly about talking about what's happening to Christians in the Middle East. They're being killed, they're being pushed out of their homes, mm -hmm. and we hear nothing about it. And I ask you again, why are we hearing nothing about the killing of Christians all over and destroying of, of all Christianity out, outside the Middle East. And the fact is, 
We Jews have learned what happens when the world is silent. Well, and this is what's happened. Well, I think there are not many people who are aware or really concerned. You look at a city like Mosul, this is 100% Christian, and suddenly there are no Christians left. I mean, it's like the Muslims want to eradicate. It's, it's genocide and a major uh, issue going on. And the world is silent. And uh, I, there are the voices like mine, but uh, I'm just one of uh, a few that are standing up for the uh, rights of the Jewish people and the rights of Christians. But I, I think we need to stand together in this, and I'm glad we are. That's the key thing. We need to stand together, and we need to speak out. Silence and indifference are the greatest enemies of both the Jewish and the Christian values, and we must speak out. And I thank you very much for the words you've said in the past. Well, thank you. On behalf of the Jewish people, we thank you. Well, together we're friends, and I'm glad uh, we're going to stand against oppression, whatever comes. And thank you for being with us, Ron Lauder. Thank you. Honored to be here. Israel's cabinet met in an emergency session to decide what to do about the wave of Palestinian terrorism. But Palestinian social media is portraying Israelis as the aggressors. Some say it's a predictable campaign of disinformation. Be warned, the video in the story is graphic. This is what a terror attack looks like and what Israelis have been facing for weeks. This Palestinian man rammed his car into a bus stop. He got out and hacked 60-year-old Rabbi Krzyzewski to death. He then began attacking 78-year-old Haviv Hamim with a meat cleaver. Finally, a nearby security guard stopped him. Despite clear evidence and security camera footage of many of these attacks, Palestinian social media is accusing Israeli police of executing the attackers. Palestinian negotiator Saeed Arakat is also calling on the International Criminal Court to investigate Israel. A case in point, Israeli police confront this Palestinian woman brandishing a knife. When she refuses to surrender the knife, they shoot her in the legs. Yet this picture implies Israeli police shot her for no reason. This picture and others fail to show the attacks themselves, just the aftermath. Yeah. Michael Widlansky, author of Battle for Our Minds, says disinformation is an old trick. Mahmoud Abbas studied disinformation techniques when he was a student in the Soviet Union at the Patrice Lumumba University of the KGB. He studied this. And it is always to invent an atrocity story. You send out somebody to kill a Jew. He kills a Jew, or three Jews, or five Jews, and then he gets killed. And then you claim he was murdered by the Israeli police. It's a bunch of baloney. What's driving many of these Palestinians to kill is, they say they must protect the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount. But one thing you should know about the Palestinian Arab leadership, they use the same formula every time. When they get into trouble, they say the Jews are coming to attack us. They're coming to attack the Temple Mount. That's what they did in 1921, 1922, 1929, what Arafat did in 2000. Mahmoud Abbas did the same thing this year. They even use the same term, Yihajimu al-Aqsa. They're attacking al-Aqsa. In order to protect the Al-Aqsa Mosque, this imam in Gaza calls on West Bank Palestinians to impose what he calls a curfew of stabbing to keep Israelis terrorized so they'll stay inside. Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat says it's this kind of incitement that kills. Those incitements are sending people to kill innocent people. We've just seen in the last few days children, uh, high school children that are incited that go and try and, uh, and terrorize and kill uh, policemen. They don't return home. They themselves get killed. The incitement kills on both sides. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. American Christians bring hope through song in the midst of the storm. Even in the midst of trouble, Israelis know the importance of making sure that life goes on. This week, a Christian choir from the U.S. helped when it visited Israel to bring joy and peace in the midst of the storm. CBN News Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has that story. 150 singing men from Georgia visited the Holy Land to encourage people here through their music. 
We're here on a tour to bring a message of hope, peace, and the love of Christ to the Holy Land, and to sing and present concerts uh, around in Nazareth, of course here in Jerusalem, and also in Bethlehem, and uh, where some of the uh, strife had been taking place. At a concert in the Tower of David Museum this week, the men sang of God's love, faithfulness, and forgiveness. It's been an incredible experience all week long, and then tonight was just a great topping it off. These worship leaders leave their local churches 10 to 12 times a year to perform in concerts. They brought friends and family members with them, all undaunted by the violence. I had some anxiety a few months ago when we were in the planning stages, and even with the, the situation over the past few weeks. We're as safe as we can possibly be anywhere on the face of this earth tonight because God's called us here. And they say it's been a good experience. We've had um, such a wonderful time and everybody's been very kind to us. And uh, I just, when I go home, I can't wait to come back. We love Israel. We love the Jewish people and um, Christian support. We support Israel. We support the Jews and uh, we love them. Caroline Shapiro Weiss, who is in charge of public relations at the Tower of David, was delighted by the concert. We've had a magical evening of song and praise and prayer from the singing men of Georgia, who despite the situation, I would venture to say, brought Christmas early to Jerusalem. Julie Stahl, CBN News, the Tower of David Museum, Jerusalem's old city. What an amazing and inspiring sound in the midst of a very difficult situation. Because of what's going on, be sure to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm Chris Mitchell. You can follow us throughout the week on Facebook, Twitter, and now on Periscope. And we'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.